end of the line. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is um, jade in the eastern Mediterranean area. And uh, this is um, a preliminary study. We're still uh, working in progress. And um, here you see some of these uh, axes from the eastern Mediterranean. In the middle, there's one of them. So we know they're there. Um, <clears throat> we just heard about uh, the study of uh, Pierre and Marie Petrian and uh, their team and about the Western European um, cluster of uh, Jedi tide axis. And um, yeah, here you see uh, the, the two sources of uh, Montevisu and Begua, and you see some of the, the Jedi tide up there. But um, Pierre also worked on another area in the Eastern Mediterranean, which he was very interested in, and which I also was interested in. So we joined forces in asking the question, what about Jedi type in the Eastern Mediterranean? Now, Pierre and his team had already done studies in, um, in the Bulgarian area and Romanian area, where they saw Italian um, Jedi type uh, axis um, being um, exported or traded through a network from Western uh, European area to the Eastern European area. So, um, especially from the Varna burials, there are Jedi type axes from the Italian Alps. Now, the question is then, what about yeah, the Eastern Mediterranean? Could we find something there? Now, one of the places that we concentrated on was Syros, uh, because we know that from old uh, geological studies that there are sources there, and they look like this. And they actually look like uh, a lot like uh, the um, Jedi type in the Italian Alps as well. Visually, there's almost no difference. Uh, maybe they're a little bit uh, lighter in their color, but uh, yeah. So there are some sources there. And then there's uh, near the Bursa area, there's uh, pink jade, Jedi type. I haven't seen many axes of pink. I've seen one, mm -hmm. but that's it. Um, and then we have uh, further east in the Sokhan region in Iran, we have the, the blue uh, jadeite height. So these are the ones that we, from geological surveys, already uh, know about. So, um, Pierre went first to uh, pick up geological samples of, uh, of the, of the jadeite height on Suras. And, uh, and then uh, the team that I was working in, we went there a little bit after in the footsteps of Pierre and Marie Petrican. Um, and the area that we were focusing on was in the northern part, in the Campus uh, uh, Valley. It's a known uh, site and that's where the stuff is, is lying all around there. It's very, it's very concentrated exactly in that valley. Uh, it's been uh, studied by many geologists, but no archaeologists have been there before. So, um, so um, you could see these larger boulders on Syros or of Jedi type. And um, through studies in the Italian Alps, uh, Pierre and Marie had done experiments where they nabbing off big lumps of uh, Jedi type is very difficult. So uh, they had this hypothesis that they burnt, uh, they had a fireplace near the bigger boulders, and then you can knock off larger pieces, which you can then produce preforms and then later access of. So that means that around the boulders, if that hypothesis is right, then there should be flakes lying around, and uh, ideally also a charcoal <laughs> underneath, which could be dated. And that's actually what he found here, and Marie Pietrin in, in the, in the sources in the Italian Alps. Now the question is then, could, could we see the same on the Syros, uh, around the Syros boulders? And we could see there was pottery there, which looked Neolithic, and we could see flakes lying around. So there must have been some sort of production, but of course the next step will then be to see if we can find some charcoal and actually uh, date the stuff, but that's something for the future. But 
it definitely has potential as one of the places of being yeah one of the few occurring places or sites that we've seen of Jedi type anyway in the Aegean. Here you see some of the Syros Jedi type. There's different um, they look a little bit different from the lighter ones and then to the darker ones and these are unpolished and then when you polish them they look a little bit different. Here you can see on the right hand side the polished ones and then on the left hand side the unpolished ones. And of course, when you then look at axes in archaeological context, they look differently again because they have a patina. So uh, it's not one to one always. <laughs> Some of the challenges and the prominence is when you look at the Italian ones and the ones from Syrus, and you look at it in the microscope, it's very difficult to see the difference. So, um, because if there's Italian axes, made of data type from Italy, found in Bulgaria and Romania, then there might be some found in, um, in the Aegean as well. And how to distinguish that from the Cirrus one, that, that was, uh, that's a challenge. When looking at the axis, you can see some differences visually. Um, some of the ones that from visually uh, and also studied by radio spectrometry by Michel Herrera and Pierre Pertin and me, we could see that some of them, <clears throat> the ones that you see on the left-hand side, uh, could originate from the Italian uh, Alps. Uh, one special feature is these larger feldspar in it. That's not a feature that we will see in the Cirrus uh, axis or axis, which you see then here on your right-hand side. So there might be some differences, but again, the pattern might might also be problematic. So. This is what I was telling about. We were doing this spectral radi radi radiometry um, made by Michel Herrera and, and Pierre's team. And these are geological samples on the top, where you see geological samples from Cirrus. And you can see on the spectra that it has different signals. And that means that in the, mineralogical, the mineralogical composition might be uh, different. So. What you were talking about was uh, omphacite jadeitite might be the case here, or maybe some more albidin or glycophane. The mineral composition definitely different. <coughs> then when you see on the axis found in uh, the axis from Bulgaria, you see uh, not as many uh, um, differences in the spectra. That means that that could be more or less pure jadeitite or less a different level of albite, albite and glycophane and all these other minerals. So differences in the Cirrus and at least the one found in Bulgaria, these axes here. We also tried in Copenhagen with Tonsi Balitsunic to do X-ray diffraction on the Cirrus samples. And there we confirmed the things that we saw in the spectrometry that it actually has more feldspar and albite and glycophane in it. And then we do, took some. Uh, we did the same analysis on some of the ones found on the Cyclades, uh, this X here, um, which we thought could be alpine. And you can see it's almost pure uh, jadeitite. So it's with two different methods. We could see the same. Um, the, the same. It gave the same result anyway. So um, that corresponds with um, with these methods that we've been using. We're trying to use multiple uh, methods and a multiple approach in order to gain further in this, uh, in this provenance uh, challenges, let me say, <laughs> that we have. Uh, here we have another example of uh, a serious uh, sample, geological sample on the top, where you also see the same um, uh, feldspar, albite, and glycophane, and different kinds of minerals. And then we took one of the axes found in northern Greece, uh, we could see the same signal with different kinds of of uh, feldspar and albite in it, so it has a different, uh, more variable mineral composition uh, corresponding to the serous material. Of course, it's not one to one, but uh, this signals that it might be from one of the more local sources in the Aegean. So, the next step that we've been looking at is uh, um, a laser basin, it's ICP uh, uh, mass spectrometry, where we could see differences between the Italian sources uh, below and then the, the Cirrus uh, sources, especially 
uh, when looking at trace elements of cesium, lead, and europium. And then, <clears throat> yeah, you could see them here, the different. So the zeros actually have a higher degree of cesium, lead, and europium compared to the Mount Viso. And this is a study by Harlow. Of course, then, I mean, Harlow, he probably did maybe five samples. We should do much more samples in order to see the variation, as has also showed in the Caribbean. And we actually did that. Uh, here you can see the cirrus samples, and you can see, we can still see the difference in the, compared to the cirrus material in the cesium and lead, but the ropium is more, a little bit, that's more overlapping. So that might be a, a place to move forward with uh, the actual axis. These are only made on the geological studies, but of course we have to have more samples also from the Italian Alps in order to verify this. The future step that we're working on is uh, uranium lead dating by uh, SEM analysis. There we can see that the re-metamorphosized of these uh, metamorphosized rock, they tend to date in different phases. George Harlow already published that, but uh, we are trying to do that with uranium lead dating of circum. And here you can see uh, the X here, and where we actually, see, even if they're polished, we can see the circum, that's the pink dots there, and there we can actually date it. And we actually dated some of the geological stuff, and that corresponds to the, to the dating that George Harlow had, that the cirrus dates around 80 to 40 uh, um, um, a million years ago, whereas the Mount Viso lies in a totally different scale of 150 to 160 million years ago. So that might be a future step to move forward. Uh, in order to prominence it. Of course, these are <laughs> destructive methods, but they only leave a, a small mark. Like, it's not as big a mark, but it's difficult for us because it's not portable. <laughs> uh, that's the challenge uh, with these things, that uh, the ICP is destructive and it's not portable, portable and uh, in order to fit in the machine, there's a limit sizes of access. So it has to be below 10 centimeters, well, actually, most of the axis in the gene is actually below 10 centimeters. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have to be too thick, and it's very expensive. So we're really struggling there. So uh, what Alice was suggesting with the portable laser, uh, that might be uh, something for the future. I mean, that, that's potentially a, a big breakthrough. I'm really pleased about your, your good results there. And maybe when you, can, uh, when you can persuade the American museums to do it, maybe we might be able to do the same in the Aegean and uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Well, who knows? But anyway, what we were then dealing with then is maybe combining some of the destructive methods with the non-destructive and then kind of uh, do some sort of protocol of how we should do it. So we might be able to take some with the destructive analysis and then do it the same test on the non-destructive and see if we can calibrate it in some way. But it's really important for us to do or have some sort of mobile method uh, um, alternative, otherwise it's really difficult for us. And one of the things that we'll be looking at is this Raman spectrometry together with a SEM or your portable solution there. We'll, we will have to talk about that later. So when we look at the visual things, we can definitely see when we compare with the actual, with the actual, uh, with the actual sources, we see at different sites where it's very clear it's jadeitite and, and, and it, it points towards uh, the, the serious things. Uh, a surprise, though, is I told you about the Bursa. You remember the Bursa, the pink jade type? Well, we had a meeting in the summer together with the geologist who, who published that source first. His name is Al Okai. So he showed me a, a pink one, the pink jade type, which I've only seen one X of. But then he showed me another one, which is very similar to that thing, which looks like the Cirrus thing or some of the things that you find in the Italian Alps this very, um, this color here kind of thing. Uh, and we had it analyzed by X-ray diffraction. And luckily, it had a huge amount of quartz in it. So 25%. So it's definitely different. But that's only one sample. But it's different from the things that we've seen so far by X-ray diffraction in the Cirrus area and in the Italian Alps. So luckily for that. But we need more samples there. It's just to say, we, we don't know all the sources. It's It's... It's still coming out there, and the more people are looking at it, not only archaeologists, but especially geologists can go through areas where they don't find it, 
because they're not looking for it. So that's really a challenge. And now here you have uh, Chukurichi Hoyak, where we have uh, clear dates of where these things are found in. So these two are actually samples of access that I was allowed to nap off. That's very rare I'm allowed to do that. And you can compare that with some of the serious material. And it's very clear that it looks the same. Unfortunately, there was a, a coup in Turkey. So the samples are still in Turkey. And I'm waiting to get them out of the country so we can analyze them. So something for the future there again. But it's very clear that they, they, they look very alike. And they're dated. The earliest layers from the early Neolithic from... Uh, 6,800 to 6,500, really, really early. So the first farming communities coming in, they start exploiting obsidian, but they also start exploiting these, these excess here, together with a lot of other raw materials, but also the jadeitite. And then until the early Bronze Age, around um, um, early third millennium, we also see excess here. So we have the whole series of exploitation just on one side. And here you see some of the axes that could possibly be from Syros, um, when you see some of them, and some of them could be of Viso and Bigua. Um, and then we have some unknown where we simply don't know where they're from. And if you look at the distribution, well, you actually cover the, most of the, the Aegean area, and, uh, and also the date from uh, 7th millennium until uh, the early Bronze Age. Um, that's what we've seen so far. And we are actually surpri I was surprised to see that these, the exchange of these Jedi Tide axes actually continues further east. So we also see something in the Kaiseri area, we've seen in the Cappadocian area, we've seen in the Antioch area, and this thing here is actually found in Saqqara in Egypt from our collection. And we've done X-ray diffraction analysis, so we know it's, it's Jedi Tide. So we're actually covering the whole Eastern Mediterranean area, and I think this might be only top of the iceberg. And this is only the, the Jedi Tide story. There's also a nephrite story. There's huge variety of nephrite in the area. And the nephrite is also used as, as, as pendants, as these frogs, which is concentrated in the northern, uh, southern Bul southern Bulgarian area and Yugoslavia and northern Aegean area. You have these pendants made of nephrite. But you also see in the area actually more numbers of axes uh, and axes of nephrite in it. But we don't know any of the sources. They're unknown. We don't know them. So that's something for the future as well. Whereas the axis of the Jedi type in this area is mostly uh, axes. And, and, and almost none of them is made out of any pendants or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> so how did these Italian ones come in? Because if there was an expo exploitation of Jedi tax axes on Sirius already from the 7th millennium, then they are the earliest ones that we know in the Mediterranean area, much before the ones that are exploited in the Big One and the Viso area. So how did the ones come, the, the Italian ones, how did they end up in the Aegean area. Well, we think that there must have been some sort of, uh, of um, exchange networks between the northern part of, uh, of the, the Bulgarian and Romanian area and the Aegean areas. And the way we see this is that there might have been some exchange of the Alpine axis and Nephrite axis, copper axis, gold objects, honey flint, and possibly also obsidian from this part of the area going down to the Aegean. And then what returned could have been obsidian going up, but also maybe Syrah's jadeite type in the excess up here in Bulgaria, marble vases and spondylus objects pendants. So during the fifth millennium with the Copper Age, there might have been more interaction uh, and, um, and, and networks between these areas, which we are only trying to understand right now. So what new knowledge can be gained of these preliminary studies, which we have to go in deeper to. Well, we know for sure now that human exploitation of Jedi type in the Eastern Mediterranean appeared, and we have the Nephrite and the Jedi type, and, but the scale of it is still unknown. So when we look at the assemblage, we might be able to find one to five Jedi type axes. So they're very exotic in the assemblage in general. Whereas there might be 10% or more 
about 10 to 15 percent of nephrite, at least in the one that I've been seeing. So they're more common in these sites here, but they're still very limited. Most of it is hematite or basalt or more local ones. But are they local ones? We don't know because they've been really selective about it. They're all re really fine materials. So there's this whole thing about the local stuff as well, which I haven't gone into, but I've, I have some numbers of it. So, and then we see signs of seafaring and inland agrarian network when the first farmers settled in Western Anatolia, where they start or begin to exploit obsidian. They knew that, we know that from analysis that it's especially the Milos obsidian they're exploiting. And on the way to Milos, well, they will stop over like other uh, ge geological uh, spectators to try to find the best material wherever they can. And this might be the places where we can see these. So these places, these querying sites, are actually meeting places where you can expect to see people. And then what happens at meeting places? Well, there might be free access, there might be interaction, and there might be uh, craving the, the, um, the, the first ideas of being civilized to each other, not just rob each other and steal from each other, um, which I think is a very interesting idea. And then the Alpine connection with the Alpine geodite access in, in the Aegean area. Well, that might be exchange uh, network from, from, the, from the west to the east in connection with the introduction of copper in the Copper Age. Because it begins up there in the Bulgarian area with, uh, with sources. And, uh, and in that connection, there might be network connection further to the south as well. And I'm sure if you look at more pottery and more proxies of examples, uh, one could find more examples of uh, this exchange network at that time. And then in conclusion with the date, we can see that they probably continued to exchange these data types, but also nephrite from the 7th until 3rd millennium in a huge network. It goes beyond the Aegean and, and Western Anatolian area, but possibly covering the whole Eastern Mediterranean region and perhaps beyond. I mean, there are areas in, in places in Syria and Iran we can't visit right now, but I'm sure that if we, if we look at other samples in Euro Europe where, where they have material from this, we will find exotics like these. But again, the sources in this area is also very, very preliminary. So Syria's maybe a Stone Age hub in the, in the Neolithic and Bronze Age. And... Of course, No Man is an Island. I've been visiting a lot of museums and been in contact with a lot of people and without them, nothing of this could, could, be, could happen. So thank you very much.